Eric is also the lead author on Neighborhood Disinvestment, Abandonment and Crime Dynamics, which was awarded the 2014 Best Conference Paper Award at the Urban Affairs Association's Annual Conference. Eric holds a Master's of Urban Planning from Wayne State University and a Bachelor of Arts in Hispanic Studies from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Eric Crowley. And uh, I, I wish I had more time here this week uh, to learn more about this community, but I can imagine I'll be back very soon. It looks like a ton of fun. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about um, engaging around data in your communities. Uh, land information is something that we deal in a lot in, uh, in our work at Data Driven Detroit. We love parcel data. It's tons of fun. We love mapping and GIS. And uh, I think that I'm actually in a room full of people who know what the word census tract means, which makes me very excited. <laughs> oh, great. All right, here we are. So, um, as Emily mentioned, we're Data Driven Detroit. Uh, we provide accessible, high quality information and analysis to drive informed decision making. It's a lot of words, not a lot of Sense. So hopefully I can describe better what we're doing here and why it should be exciting to everyone. So uh, I imagine that a lot of you understand that there are tons of data sources in the world. It's, there's a lot out there, right? So you can grab information from your watch, from your phone, from the federal government, from the states, from counties, from cities, and from residents themselves. And it can be a little bit unclear what to do with all of that information that, and it's more and more every day. I just talked to a company out in California that's scraped all the different open data sites and state websites around the country and they've accumulated more than 700,000 different data streams all coming into their, their data warehouse. Uh, that's a lot and it grows exponentially uh, as we move forward in our society. Be a fascinating time. So, at Data Driven Detroit, we try to take that smog, sift through it, curate it, and bring it together in one place so that people can access it and then hopefully understand what the heck to do with it once they've got access. So, we do that through data collection, kind of bringing together all those different streams, but also going out and doing primary data collection where needed. We do data visualization work because spreadsheets don't make people tingle like they need tingle. Uh, and it can be really helpful to have some pictures to, to help you interpret that information and, and make sure that we're kind of evening the playing field in terms of understanding data and what it means. Uh, and we also do data analysis of all different types. Uh, you know, my research focuses on crime dynamics and neighborhood characteristics, but you can do that around transportation or understanding blight, which I'm going to talk to you about today and how to actually operationalize the strategy for whatever it is you're trying to do, whether you're you know, asking questions or trying to solve problems or dealing with, I just shoot, homelessness. You know, how do we address that in the best way possible with the resources that we have today? Uh, and then accessibility work. So like I said, not just here's access to raw data, here, enjoy the spreadsheet of information, but also teaching people about data literacy, about how to use information in their day-to-day -day lives to make better decisions. And we do all of this work in the name of data-driven outcomes. Uh, just a couple of photos to kind of demonstrate the types of work that we're doing. Uh, so we do graphs, we love maps, lots and lots of maps. Uh, we love personal maps uh, the most, perhaps. Uh, we can do social network analysis, we have done so in some projects in Detroit. Uh, it can also be really helpful to supplement, like I said, the, the information that's already available from existing streams with uh, collected data from the field. Uh, residents being engaged in this process can be really, really powerful. And uh, you will find a, a handful of folks around the globe at this point who are really thinking more deeply about both participatory research and participatory analysis. And the, the value of that you know, coming together, the, the experts, the, the data wonks, and real people who live in 
their own neighborhoods and their own communities and bringing those things together can be just incredible, an incredible experience on both sides. Uh, so in, yep, there we go. Uh, in 2013, I, I don't know if you've heard, we've had a little bit of a struggle with blight in the city of Detroit. There's a little bit of a bailment, a little bit of population loss, meaning that we've got uh, a bunch of vacant buildings and also a lot of like trash piles of, I don't know, tires, couches, bridges, whatever, just kind of left behind as the population filters ever outward. It's really interesting to hear the, the history of Milwaukee and how that, that spread happened and how the, the wealth kind of drew um, in directions that were, you know, kind of ever outward from the core. We experienced uh, something similar in Detroit for the last 60 odd years. And uh, that means that as we pull the population ever outward, as our land has developed on the, on the fringes of our region every decade to the tune of something like 10,000 housing units per year were developed in excess of demand in our region since 1950, every year. That's nuts. So no kidding, we have a population uh, decline in the city of Detroit and an abandonment issue of housing and other uh, buildings. So we know we need to deal with this. There was the whole wonderful TARP reallocation of funds, the Target Asset Relief Program. Uh, actually, our, our Flint Land Bank coordinator, who is now a, um, in Congress, helped to convince folks at federal level that some of those funds for certain communities should be redeployed as these hardest hit funds that could be used not just for uh, mortgage relief but also for uh, blight remediation. I think in this case they originally designated it as demolition only uh, funds. But we, so we got those funds, which is great. We had something like 42, 43 million dollars to start just in the city of Detroit. Uh, but no one knew where the blight was or where to go with the dollars and how to actually effectively distribute that. And we had a crazy timeline of something like eight months to go before you were allowed to, you know, the cutoff of when those dollars could be used. So uh, we have our wonderful resident billionaire, Dan Gilbert, he's the uh, founder and owner of Quicken Loans, uh, was saying that to the feds, you know, hey, got to do a blight thing, got to do a blight thing. They're like, great, go ahead and get started. It's going to be tons of fun. You just tell us what the plan is. So formed this task force. Uh, he co-chaired it along with a couple of local, uh, long-time Detroit residents and community activists, Linda Smith and Glenda Price. But then also brought together this incredible crew of 40, 50, 60 people around the table, all of our philanthropic, government, uh, nonprofit and private sector leaders all coming together around the same table and forming this task force. So they all get around the table sometime in uh, September, October of 2013, and Gilbert says, Okay, great, we're gonna make a plan. How much blade is there? It's like, Oh, I don't know. Where is it? I don't know. How much will it cost? We don't know. <laughs> so, how do we start? Someone at the table knew of Data Driven Detroit. We had been around for six or seven years at the time, and we had actually done a parcel survey in Detroit uh, with a handful of partners back in 09 um, of just the residential parcels. So about 350,000 of the 380,000 parcels in the city of Detroit. We had done that survey, and we had been using those data with community groups and, and government leaders for years because it was the best that we had. The assessor's department in Detroit doesn't make it out in a, every couple of years as it is supposed to, to do the reassessments. No one had visited all the parcels uh, before or since. And uh, so we were working with those data, but someone said, you know what, data for Detroit, if they don't really answer, I bet they know how to find it. So they invited us to the table, which was great. Um, except we got to the table and said, well, I can give you three different data sources that tell you three different numbers and none of them tell you down to the parcel level exactly where the blight is. We wanted to actually understand sort of this big picture, uh, here's the why of what the heck we were doing. You need to actually have the data to understand the scope of the challenge that you're facing. It can actually inform a plan to address all of the blight around the city. Um, we wanted to ensure that, since we knew we had to collect new data, uh, 2009 when we were work for us, and I'll show you why in a second, uh, engaging residents in the process of actually collecting that data, we, we felt like that was a missed opportunity back in 09. We had something like a third of the people that were involved were actual Detroit residents, the others were grad students because it was free labor and we loved that. Um, 
we also thought that if residents were participating in this uh, and community groups and we actually mobilized around this, that we could actually have a dialogue uh, where the people in power were actually hearing from the people on the ground and, and have that conversation in a way that would make the plan better. Um, and I'll say, I'll, I'll give a little spoiler, we didn't achieve that in full, but we really tried hard. Um, and then feedback at the time. We needed to leave something in place to make sure that that occurred because we didn't want to get back into the same situation where five years later everyone's like, okay, Native Detroit, Detroit, where's the Detroit, where's the blight? What's going on? We wanted to leave something for in place so that there was a feedback loop over time and that we could keep monitoring the situation um, as funds were deployed. So here's why the own idea to work going to work for us. Uh, I'm sure you all live this, but it's so stark sometimes when I take a look at the streets. Um, this is a, an avenue, Cass Avenue, in 2007. This is 09. This is 2011. And you can even see there's like, hey, there's stuff in the storefront there. It's great. Uh, oh, there's a building there. That's 2013. And then here's just a few months later in 2013. Now, it goes the other direction as well, surprise. Here's a uh, view, you're gonna see the same exact spot in <coughs> Detroit. There's the address in 08. That's 09. That's 2011. And that's 2013. It's fast, right? So, in 2009, we had done 350,000 parcels worth of data collection on paper. With 36 people, it took us six, seven, eight months after they finished in the field to data enter all of the, the data that streamed in and to do some spotty quality checks, right? And that was incredible and powerful. And we used those data for years with resident groups to help them sort of level set to start uh, planning for their future, saying we didn't really have a functional planning department at the time. So residents and community groups were doing this come to the table with this crazy map, block level aggregation based on a lot of these data and some census data saying, okay, here's where you are right now. Great, now we have a community group that is going to facilitate a conversation to get you from there to what do you want to look like in the future, to go all over the maps, it's really great. We take those files back and digitize them so that the groups have a before and an after, big giant plotted maps they can hang up in the community center. Um, and then that community group actually helps them action plan to get to where they want to go and have budgets along with that and be able to seek money from foundations. So that's how we were doing uh, community planning in the city of Detroit for several years. Um, and again, data, best we had. So, 350000 on paper, months and months and months, quality control, very little, have a working database, which then we weren't actually allowed to release because parcel level data, the objects themselves, were protected by the assessor's office and by our county register teams, and we couldn't let them out, which meant we were like the keepers of these parcel data, which unfortunately meant that, you know, there's eight or nine of us, right? We can't do all of the neighborhoods in Detroit, so it was very spotty and challenging. 2014, woohoo, we have the technology. We had a mobile app, a platform to monitor, you can see on this map here, we gridded the entire city into these um, grid cells called microhoods. at the time. Uh, we would deploy people into the field. We hired 150 Detroit residents and actually paid them for their time. Uh, those blue dots that are on the map are actually people out in the field at that exact moment. And on the right-hand side, you can see the feed rolling in. That is, it's almost like Twitter. It would just roll, 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 and it had a little counter at the top. We took a screenshot when we hit 300,000, so it was pretty exciting. Uh, if you remember 2013, 14 winter snowpocalypse, tons of fun. Uh, we had a, an amazing time. It was, it was great fun. 150 people dedicated in the field, 35 working days. They collected all of the data. We did live quality control with a team of 20 to 30 people on any given day sitting back at the at HQ. And within seven days after completion in the field, we had a live working quality control data set ready for use uh, in February of 2014. Which meant that there was enough time to analyze and plan for the deployment of the HHF funds once the ground was unfrozen uh, so we could actually use those dollars effectively. 
pretty exciting. So here's the, just a quick overview of the survey itself. Um, it's, it, these are a handful of photos from HQ, and every morning people would come in and get their assignments, their tablets, and um, thank goodness for Google, and for, honestly, for Quicken Loans and all of the work that they did to get us tablets, and fastest move ever, uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, but it was an emergency, so yeah. Here are the questions. You'd start by taking a photo, structure or no, and then it would actually use skip logic to take you to two different sets of questions, um, which I bet a lot of folks in here understand already. These different sorts of questions can get us a whole lot of information that together are pretty powerful. We also had a group that was very interested in, because we were moving so quickly and because they knew that the land bank authority would be deploying those demolition dollars very quickly, we equipped them with a tool, another mobile platform from local data that let them organize volunteers and go out and collect parcel by parcel in historic districts or potential historic districts, all of the data that they cared about around the historic significance of properties. And that we were able to fold all of those, since we had the same base layer of parcels, we were able to fold all of those data into the final result uh, that we turned back over to Land Bank Authority and others and actually made public at the launch, uh, which is just incredible, at the launch of the report from the task force. That day we made a, a live open data set of 380,000 parcels worth of data for anyone to use. Uh, so we had these data from the field, which was fantastic. We also had this amazing opportunity because the task force was so big, because the time pressure was so great, because the visibility was so high, we were able to leverage out a ton of other data that we had never seen come out before, um, and it was just being thrown at us. So there's a group called ClearCore that had done lead remediation work in, in houses in the city. They're like, here, have our data set. We've done four or 500 houses in the last couple of years, and you'll know that those are lead remediated. Great. So that they don't need to be uh, as stringently uh, demoed. Uh, we're trying to use wet, wet, wet protocols on the demolitions because so many of our houses are built before 1950, actually. Um, so we could get ownership information, so we could actually contact owners before they were demoed. This didn't all exist in one place before. There was another pot of funds that were discovered, something like $19 million sitting in some bank account somewhere. Uh, that was actually the fire escrow fund for the city of Detroit. So part of getting fire insurance on your home in Detroit starting probably around the 70s or 80s because we started having an arson problem. Um, a portion of that had to be set aside in this escrow account in case your house burned down and would, those funds would be used to address the remaining lot or, you know, I don't know, ash and gas, which happens a lot. My husband's a Detroit firefighter. I'm pretty familiar with this concept. Uh, so, unfortunately, because we didn't understand our parcel objects or the ownership or, you know, we, honestly, we don't even have a master address file inside the city right now. Today, we don't have one. Uh, those fire escrow funds just sat there. And so there were all these burnt out shells of houses hanging out that could have been remediated before, but because the fire escrow data had never seen the light of day, <laughs> and because it never got connected to the actual parcel where it could be deployed, we hadn't used it. So we were able to tie those data in as well, which has been an awesome help to that first 42 million that we got. Um, here are just, just some quick stats, I'm sure no one really cares, but uh, you know, we surveyed 380,000 properties, we found blight or the potential for blights uh, in the next five years, since you can't stand your fingers and make it go away in a day probably around 80,000. The current blight at that moment was about 40,000 parcels with another 6,000 to 6,500 lots that had uh, dumping issues on them, which I will caveat and always do with the fact that it was snowpocalypse and there was so much snow, we we're pretty sure we didn't see all of the dumping piles. 70% uh, of the parcels in the city at that time had structures on them, wow. Uh, one in three-ish were blighted. Um, I don't know how oh, long close that out real quick. Uh, today, something like uh, between a third and two thirds of all of the parcels in the city of Detroit are owned either by the um, land bank or some other public entity or by uh, speculators, people who own more than 50 properties in Detroit. It's a really fascinating time for the city uh, given the history of urban areas around our country. 
we can talk a little bit about that toward the end. Uh, so, what the heck do we do with all of that data? It's amazing that we have it, right? That's awesome uh, for database. But what about policymakers and people who have money to actually do something about it? So if you look at the map of, here's the parcels that were identified as blended at the time. It's great, awesome, what do I do? Uh, maybe just send trucks out, you know, contractors to go and demo all over the place. Mm, probably not gonna be that effective. Uh, we can also see all of the overlapping sort of planning and target areas, lots of different groups and different pots of funds and different uh, philanthropic organizations and city investment areas. Where do these all lay out? And kind of thinking about that, where can one start in the city of Detroit with the first set of funds that you do have, given that the scope of the challenge is likely to be nearly a billion dollars worth of um, addressing blight over the course of five or 10 years, uh, where do we start today with what we had? Because we don't have a billion dollars to deal with it. If you think about, so students of urban planning, urban studies, et cetera, will probably recognize this uh, concept, the tipping point or thresholds. Uh, if you think about the stability of neighborhoods over time, as you hit a decline point, if you invest at that moment, a small amount of resources, you can get it back into a stable trajectory. But if you wait until it's already declined to so unstable, the amount of resources to get it back up to where it was is just exponentially greater. So thinking about that concept uh, and talking with a whole lot of amazing uh, both academics and policy makers who have lived this experience in many different communities around the country, uh, we work together to create this framework for maximizing community impact. And our theory is, this is, uh, I'll start with our values um, in just a second, but really what we did was kind of take the, give me the picture across the entire city of areas that will best meet the objectives for intervening, and then tell me of those that are sort of highest potential impact areas, which ones are on that point of tipping over so that we can intervene now rather than waiting for them to fall all the way down. Uh, so you take that neighborhood dynamic score, look at the two highest quartiles of, of potential impact areas, and then run those ones through the threat score index, and then the two highest threat uh, levels, quartiles, would actually be the prioritized areas. Goals, values, et cetera, always important. So we want to think about improving quality of life for the greatest number of people. And uh, actually given so all of those overlapping target areas, there are a lot of other people who want to invest, who have energy, who want to make life better for everyone in the city of Detroit, residents themselves, business owners, and so on. How do we improve the investment climate to the extent, the greatest degree possible so that then others will join in and it's not just our tiny pot of $42 million dollars uh, that gets deployed. So uh, we actually have to think about some analytical choices in, in choosing our priorities. So we ended up choosing this uh, sort of residential and decline. Um, most of the community is actually residential parcels. We something like 30,000 of the 380,000 are not residential. So we focused there and then looking for areas that are um, on the precipice of decline. We picked a bunch of indicators. So we had the, the greatest wealth of data we'd ever seen for Detroit ever down to the parcel level. Uh, we threw a bunch of indicators into the mix and checked for collinearity and wound up with only four that would help us uh, on the neighborhood threat or neighborhood dynamics index. And same thing for the threat index, a bunch in the mix and came down to two. So these are the results of the indicators. So the dynamics would look at occupied structures, the average condition rating of structures, and then there, there are people, right? Population under 18 per square mile, highest uh, impact on quality of life for the greatest number of people. And then looking at those sort of mortgage transactions per square mile, which is a hot mess in Detroit already, but that's a whole other story. And then on the threat side, we looked at changes, right? So the uh, foreclosure 
foreclosures per square mile for 2008-13, and that's both the shared deeds and the tax foreclosures, which over that time period, we actually saw the tax foreclosures go uh, exponentially up and the mortgage foreclosures actually declined quite a bit because there's just fewer mortgages to foreclose on. Um, and then the change in the, because we had the 09 data and we used the same question set, just slightly augmented in 2013-14, we could see the change in average residential condition. So that, that is uh, pretty exciting. Very simple index, bring together, we, you know, Here's your neighborhood dynamic score between zero and one, resulting from the combination of those four factors. This is what the map looks like when we, uh, this is a block or group level of analysis, there we go. The blue areas are those areas that have the highest and higher potential impact. So we take those geographies and run them through the next index. And then again, elevated threat and highest threat in the blue areas. We look at the results there. Uh, funny enough, this actually aligned almost precisely with the original HHF uh, Hearts Hit Fund boundaries that were designated through three different groups, crunched very different types of data to come to almost exactly the same conclusion. It was pretty cool. But what this did was allow them to expand those boundaries a little bit because when, we, when they got into those areas, they realized that there were fewer um, places to be demoed than they had dollars for. It's absolutely amazing. And this actually covers uh, 200,000 of the 700,000 people that were living in Detroit at that time. Uh, the under 18 population of roughly 120, 130,000 kids, 60,000 of them lived in these areas. So making sure that the hard state fund boundary is where they're trying to stabilize neighborhoods expanded into these geographies, some of which were already incorporated in there help them deploy those resources very quickly and we're hoping eventually to the to the greatest um, improvement possible for not just that neighborhood but also to catalyze investment in surrounding areas. So time will tell, right? No idea. So uh, what comes after, we actually, I mean the hope was that we would keep collecting this data over time. There's only so much uh, money out in the world. We actually we left the mobile data collection app open to the public and free after the project closed down. We also uh, were able to get mini grants from foundations to help us um, stimulate community groups actually organizing around these, these uh, using the platform, but also collecting their own data that they cared to see. That was really, really important to us. We did deploy $100,000 in mini grants, um, 80,000 additional parcels uh, were, not additional parcels, 80,000 parcels were uh, given additional observation points throughout the course of 2014 and in early 2015, which is amazing. But the sustained investment and, and dedication of residents to just like walk down the street and keep collecting data, really not there. So we're trying to figure out what that looks like going forward. In the meantime, the app is still free and people can do it if they get, a, you know, get excited about doing so or if something changes. We're also talking to city staff to see if perhaps as they're out in the field, as firefighters are out there putting out a fire, they can say, hey, here's a photo, guess what, this one has fire damage. Um, <laughs> there are people that are out there all the time anyway, so how can we use what's the activities that are already occurring uh, to keep the data fresh so that the city and everybody can use it for their work? Uh, and then over time, we're, our hope is to retool the framework for maximizing community impact to one, assess whether it's working, and two, you would need to rerun the indices as neighborhoods became stabilized. What are the next areas that one would need to go? Uh, I think it's really helpful to think about, um, it's one of my favorite circles, plan something, then do it, then check if it's working, and then act again and then plan. Right, it's a, this is not ever going to end. We need to build in checkpoints um, and also and build in that feedback loop for ourselves as people who are doing this kind of work out in the world. Um, we value resume inclusion because we actually think that it makes the work better. Um, we, the first time around when we had grad students collecting the data, they lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan town, amazing group, mostly from middle to upper, upper middle class backgrounds, coming into the city of Detroit saying, oh, that's vacant, that's vacant, that's vacant, that's, that's suggest demolition. 
not the way that residents of the city of Detroit see the world, right? Um, so having their voice and their view and their perspective at the table was very helpful for um, making sure that the data reflected the community and also uh, throughout the entire process, they were the ones who had the most uh, and best suggestions for process improvement throughout. Um, just keeping in mind that we can value people who aren't necessarily, you know, PhDs. Um, they live in the world. They they have managed to stay alive. They, they also have value and can contribute to the conversation. It can be really helpful. Um, I, I did want to talk a little bit about yeah, great. Cut Group. Uh, Smart Chicago uh, established a cut group in Chicago. Uh, they have actually helped us figure out this model uh, as applied to Detroit. It means Civic User Testing Group. There are lots of civic apps and websites that are developed in the world, and it's really great that people want to connect residents, community groups, nonprofit organizations, philanthropy with the data that you know you have the data, right? It's amazing. And I bet you want for people to be able to use it in ways uh, that would be useful to them, but also be useful to you. Uh, Cut Group can be a really great way of making sure that it's connecting with real people. We've run two tests so far in Detroit, and it, essentially what this is is, uh, as established by Smart Chicago and their Cut Group Chicago, uh, they came eventually to this model of, Hey, anyone can sign up to be a civic user tester. We want your feedback. We want your opinion on the websites that are being developed inside city government or using city government data. Sign up and we'll give you a $5 gift card. Great, that establishes your network. And then every time you run a test, you can actually pay people uh, with $20 gift cards for their time when they come and give their feedback, their thoughts, their opinions, their um, wishes for what else it could do for them. Uh, we ran actually one of these uh, on a city, we have the Department of In Innovation and Technology at the City of Detroit. They are trying to connect people with data better, uh, but they it, they have a good humble nature about them. They were looking at this commercial property tool that they developed, and it's using Esri tools, which is fantastic, it's their backbone. Um, eventually, hopefully, the integrity of the backbone of the city once it's all put back to the area. Uh, they spun up a very quick, took like a couple of hours tool, to, and they're like, I think this will be helpful, and then ran it through a couple of tests. It was fantastic to get feedback of, hey, great, 39% of people tested think this was very easy to use. Some people thought it was very difficult, something to think about. And then, is this targeted to you, yes or no? 54% said no, why? Seems like it's better for planners or developers or for people who work in office environments. Interesting feedback. So who is your audience? Who are you trying to connect with? So important. Um, I will talk, I can talk more about Cook Group if folks have any questions at all. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I did want to talk uh, just very briefly about now that we have this amazing resource in Detroit, and this is totally possible for anyone else, I know there's, um, there are a lot of great data shops around the country who are doing this kind of work, and it's not impossible. You can absolutely achieve this. Parcel objects, extra tax roll data, all of these data exist, and we've got a lot of folks in the room here who can contribute to something like this. Uh, but once we have that, how do we look at, just like John was talking about earlier, God, neighborhoods are very fluid, they change, people move, build, new businesses open, businesses close. Uh, I mentioned that stat earlier about how much of the city right now is owned by not regular residents, but rather speculators in the city itself or its authority. Uh, we are feeling some momentum in Detroit at this point, and we've seen this in New York, we've seen it in San Francisco, we've seen it in Chicago, we've seen it in urban areas around the country where you have a period of decline, however long, and then you have a, a resurgence of rebounding, and a lot of people use the, the G word, gentrification, which can actually, depending on how you define it, that's a great thing, right? So not having 40% of your census tracts in uh, concentrated poverty, but, you know, it can actually be an opportunity for good, positive change if you do it in an inclusive way. 
we haven't achieved that in, in, in a mass scale in the United States that I'm aware of. Uh, but we're hoping that in Detroit, by helping put in place some data systems that will help us monitor neighborhood change closer to real time, understand how people feel about it, and then actually connecting that information with people who can do something about it, we're hoping that we might be an example moving forward, or at least we'll have learned something that we can share with the rest of our communities around the country uh, to hopefully build on from there, because at some point we will figure this out as human beings. So in Detroit right now, we've got our sort of downtown, midtown area, the original core of Detroit. Is, we're, we're seeing it, you can feel it. You walk around downtown, you're like, gosh, there are other people walking around here. What's going on? There are businesses popping up all of a sudden, car park and coach are opening up locations. Wow, okay, that's interesting, that's new for us. Uh, but it's also caused some pressure that we're, again, anecdotally, I can't tell you yet because American Community Survey is more, uh, I can't tell you from the data, but I can say that from the lived experience, that up to the north end and over to uh, past this, we've got this great little hipster community in Corktown pushing over into the uh, historically Hispanic community of Southwest Detroit. Those conversations are happening and we're hoping, using some of our advantages, of this Motor City Mapping Project that I mentioned, all of the parcel data, um, and the cities move toward opening their data. So they've got building permits streaming out, they've got criminal offense records streaming out, they've got 80 to 100 different data sets that they've liberated and are making public for the community to use. By combining those forces, we're really hoping that we can do some solid modeling to get some leading indicators of neighborhood change. Uh, we have great property data, but we are not poor in property or people data, so we're trying to figure that out. We have researched, uh, like I said at the very beginning, uh, We've got data sources galore, and they're popping up more and more and more every time, every day. We went back and looked at 50 new ones that we hadn't examined before, and I think that we're at the point where we're saying that some, I, the ideal is gonna end up being a combination of a lot of different data sets. Uh, but we're now in the midst of testing some causal models to see if we can identify leading indicators of neighborhood change so that we can kind of pop up those caution flags geographically around the city to kind of give warning, hey, policymaker, hey, residents, let's have a conversation about this place. Are, are we seeing something change here? What can we do to make sure that we're preserving the affordability base of this neighborhood and the composition of you know old and new residents in this area and make it our Detroit instead of this old versus new? And then we're also doing qualitative research, uh, for interviews and focus groups, trying to better understand, again, what signals are people actually looking at in their environment, but also how is the lived experience of this playing out across the city? Eventually, I'd love to set up listening posts at every church and barbershop around the entire city of Detroit, have that feed into that uh, warning system, but we'll see how it goes. So, we do a lot of work in the name of data-driven everything. Uh, I think, hope, that some of these examples help you and your work to come. I did want to give a quick mention that there are others like Data Driven Detroit around the country. If you visit the national or neighborhoodindicators.org or Google National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, you will find more of us. Uh, a lot of people with passion for data, mapping, visualization, and for uh, improving access to opportunity for everyone in this country. So I thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it, and if you want to contact me at all, uh, my information is up there. I'll be around for uh, a good portion of the day today. Ending a little early, I can take questions if you'd like to or I'm happy to Please shush. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? All right. Thanks for the watch. Hi. Hey. So you had said that um, you got the feedback that that app was not for them, the communities. Uh, do you know like what some things or from that, have you learned like what things work, I guess, with citizens over people in the office? Yeah, so we've done two tests so far. One of them was with a city of Detroit, super quick spun up app. Uh, the other one was with a group called the Detroit Ledger Project. They, it's just on the side, have been gathering data on where grants are deployed inside the city of Detroit and amassing this crazy database. Uh, we're in the middle of writing the, the feedback report on that right now. Uh, but what we have talked about, actually, literally yesterday, let's put it, two days ago, there we go, 
Um, internally at D3, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we not presume what people need, but rather have the technologists develop something that is actually called for from the community. So we are talking right now about putting together something like a quarterly civic tech meetup where we're having, it, it will be hosted in a community center by residents themselves where they say, these are the problems that we're facing. Please help us figure out how to deal with that and have the technologists in the room hear that and then take a quarter to develop the solution and come back again and then do the test. Um, because we don't know. That's, I guess that's the answer at the end of the day. I can guess, I'm a resident myself. I, my husband's a firefighter, he's dealing with people all the time in the city. Uh, we can guess, but no one knows the answer. So the, that's the thing, just ask that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What is the digital fluency like? It, it ranges. Yeah, and actually it was a great experience in the, um, the survey work even to have, we had everyone from 18, I think our oldest uh, surveyor, see, either just before or just past 70 years old. So we had a very wide range of folks who participated in that process. And that's a seven tablets. I'm a Mac lady, I can't help it. Uh, I don't know how to use a Nexus. So actually I was learning a lot with them, which was great, just even how to turn this darn thing on. Um, I think with very basic sort of level setting around skills, people are pretty darn smart. Um, eventually, again, I, I think my 69-year-old resident surveyor was one of the, the fastest with the tablets. Um, mobile technology is pretty well established. Uh, smartphones are there. Kids are doing their homework outside of school on, on a smartphone that they share in the, among their household. That's there, it's the, I think, more than the desktop and the more powerful computers. So things where, as a technologist, if you can think about less client-side um, processing that needs to be done and, and bear more of the load in communities like this uh, on the, the serving side of the technology, that is gonna be better for folks who are mostly dealing with the smart tech, or smartphone side of things. So hopefully that wasn't too long. Anyone else? You want to say it for a minute? Oh, there we go. Has the lamp bank adopted and SCI prioritized the benefits? Are we being recorded at this point? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, it's unclear whether the framework for maximizing community impact has been fully adopted by the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Oh, we can't end on that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, yep. Yeah. How do you get all those different data sets from different organizations to play nice together? Oh, Meaning like they're, they're different formats, different, you know, you know. Yeah. So do you use their ways to get them to work together? We spent the last year actually trying to automate the feeds in because we did a lot of human labor to connect all those disparate data sets from different places and different formats and so on. Did a, it took a lot of massaging, but now that we know the massage technique to get it in, we're working on scripting all of that so it can be a little bit more automated. Um, it's a challenge to make data talk to each other, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, that whole no master address list is a big challenge. I will say some of the third party data systems have made some significant progress that would be worth exploring uh, as in your own communities. We were able to test using a couple of different sources, things like Velasis, which takes the US Postal Service data, they're a third party vendor of the, the USPS data. Um, Nets we've had in the past, the National Establishment Time Series database, which folds in, it's done a Brad Street base, but it's got a lot of businesses, churches, and other nonprofit locations over time. Some of those have figured out some pretty cool ways of doing stuff, so if you can use that as a base and then learn from it, it's, it's really helpful. And then uh, Federal Reserve has been helpful in our more recent project, this turning the quarter project, uh, trying to figure out the monetary neighborhood change. They get special cuts, Federal Reserve Banks all, all around the country, they get special cuts of things like CoreLogic, amazing. Uh, I think they just purchased for the whole country the Nets database, the Chicago office is holding that one. Call them, oh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Data dissemination specialist from the Census Bureau. You should totally look that up. They are amazing. We love them. Uh, anyways, so how do you make them talk to each other? You figure it out. Uh, it's not perfect, but eventually you can get them to speak to each other. I think technology is improving to the point where you can, uh, shoot, I can connect Excel, Access, SQL, MySQL, and Postgres, and make them all come into the same uh, location. There's great ETL tools out there to help you uh, figure that out. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time this morning.